don't know. I feel like uh, I, I always call myself I'm a more complete beast. <laughs> I like that. I, it, it's if if you're looking for a practice that has the sorcery, the philosophy, and the healing, I mean, tantra might be something to look into if you're listening to this. It's whether it's Hindu tantra or Tibetan tantra. I mean, they're very distinct and different, but. Maybe maybe one of those is for you, um, and the relationships that you cultivate with these deities. It's very loving. It's a very like when you're doing sadhana with one deity, you completely fall. Give yourself into the rapture of just falling in love with this spirit, falling in love with this deity, and it it's a freeing experience. And. I mean, it can be a sorceress sadhana where you're trying to have an end goal in sight, but the love is part of it's part of that experience, and you'll get these strange coincidences. I've I've been doing Kurukula work, and in her iconography, I don't know if you can see it very well, but she's holding an, a bow and arrow. Right. I've actually found arrowheads on two occasions. I can even pick them up and show you. Wow. I found arrowheads when I've been hiking and working with her. Hello and welcome to the Spirit Box Podcast, where we explore folklore, magic, the world of the spirits, and everything in between. Today we welcome Colby Sammons. Colby is a practicing sorcerer, occultist, and Buddhist, specializing in Tibetan tantric sorcery. He specializes in teaching occult meditations and techniques, but also offers ritual work and divination via his Instagram page. A proponent of Bajriani Buddhism and Tantra, Colby takes us through how practices within these areas have improved his life in almost every way. And specifically, we explore Bajrakilia and the use of the Purba. And I know I'm not pronouncing these long tantric names, you know, so don't feel the need to to at me yeah it's an interesting conversation and colby takes us through his experiences with working with with deities like kura kula um and and how meaningful it has been for him and we talk about how that manifests in 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 real tangible ways uh, the conversation goes in different areas and we end up chatting about uh, the indian province of nagaland and, and the practices of the the headhunters there in the Plus Show, Colby discusses how he mixes his hoodoo and conjure practices with Tantra, what works and what doesn't. And I go through some of my adventures in Nepal um, when I accidentally almost, but well, not accidentally, I almost bought a human bone, a human trumpet bone, and, uh, and we discuss Kapalas. And Colby goes on to explain the fascinating practice of chode and the use of human bones in Tantra going on to tell me an astonishing tale about how the tongue of a dead man has been used to create a purba. And we close out with Colby taking us through some of his work, some of his magical work, helping people with spirit and magic-based problems. So it's an interesting show, and I think one you're going to enjoy. Now, before we get into it, uh, a couple of shout-outs. Mademoiselle Vondry, uh, who you will know from the show, is hosting a sex workers magical workshop in um, June, July. Um, you can find the link to that in the shout out section, the show notes. And Joshua Cutchin is running a course on NDEs, um, which promises to be fantastic. Josh is deeply, deeply knowledgeable in, in, in these areas. So there's two great pieces if you're interested, um, you can check those out in the show notes. Now, if you want to hear the Plus Show, um, just join the Patreon. Pretty straightforward. Um, and you get a host of the back catalogue um, shows. I mean, it's coming up to, well, this is 138, but there's a lot more in there as well. Um, half that again, I'd say, in terms of bonus shows and content and essays and what have you. Um now, I, at the end of March, I'm planning to clo just close the Patreon for a couple of months um, just so I can take some time off and look at some other projects. But if uh, if you join, you still get all the back catalog and you won't get charged until um, you get charged for one month and then you won't get charged until I come back. 
It's as simple as that. So it's it's pretty pretty good deal. Right, let's get on with the show. Um, it is my great pleasure to welcome Colby Simmons to the um, to the show. Colby, you're very welcome to the Spirit Box. We got there eventually. Um, we did. Yeah, somehow Colby's presence um, made my microphone give up the ghost. And um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a decent microphone too, so it's not a piece of shit. There's no... There's no... So I, I, I suspect there, there, there's... Um, you're going to bring some magic to this show if you've already killed my equipment. Um, so <laughs> really nice to meet you. You're super welcome to the show. Um, it'd be great if you could introduce yourself and tell the people a little about you and your practice and... Over to you. Well, of course. I'm so happy to be here, man. Um, so my name is Colby Sammons. Uh, I grew up in rural Colorado. I come from a ranching family, and that's why I got my got my hat on today. My fiance they wanted me to wear it for the interview, so I figured, oh, I will. Um, so since I was uh, in my teenage years, I started off just practicing, like, I was trying to do Goetia. That's that's what I say I was trying. Wasn't very safe with it. Um I I've always been pretty obsessed with the runes, uh, and like with Norse magic, but I mean as a lot of listeners know that tradition in the pagan way isn't as alive as it used to be. And I didn't I got to the point where I could only get so far with it. And around that time I was having some uh I would call it a, a near death experience or, you know, and a lot of like depression. And I found the teachings of Buddhism and I I'd always kind of liked witchy stuff. Like I I've done a lot of study in hoodoo. And when I found Buddhism, I was like, well, this doesn't have magic, <laughs> but it does. It has a lot. And I guess as I progress learning about the, uh, the teachings, the philosophy, I eventually came to the point where I started to see all these amulets online. And I was like, well, that's cool that these guys are Buddhists, but they're all the way in Thailand. So um, I ended up taking a Tibetan retreat. I didn't go to Tibet, but nearby there's a retreat center that I visited. And during my time there, I found like a strong resonance. And I eventually found Jason Miller's work with a uh, curricula and I read Veronica Rivas's uh, curricula and curricula was kind of my first tantric practice. And I dedicated a long time to working with her. And eventually I adopted Vajra Kalaya work. I got my empowerment. Um, and I started learning about Akala and I already knew about Ganesha, but I started learning how to work with him from a Tibetan perspective. And yeah, so I, I've been learning about Tantra for the past two to three years. And my life has completely changed. My my mental health has changed. Um, my, I guess my financial circumstances have changed. My love life has changed. It just kind of grabbed me and just spun me around. And then just I landed in a better place. It's just, it's been a beautiful experience. And um, I've recently started to, I guess, market my skills right. as a sorcerer. And I also would love to start teaching more. That's kind of my main goal is I want to start imparting this knowledge to people. Yeah. Because, so I guess that's my background. Cool. Well, um, you, you, you're, you're really welcome. Um. Both um <clears throat> both Jason Miller and uh, Veronica Rivas have been on the show uh, in the past. Um and um a, a, a mutual friend of uh, or or kind of associate of, of of Jason and I, um Lonnie Scott, who does the show Weird Web Radio, um, which is an awesome an awesome show. Um he introduced me to to Jason a couple of years ago off the back of of my travel work and he shared some photographs of oh my god what's the name of it the cremation grounds in Kathmandu it's like 
Passion, like my memories mm, shot mm. shit, but that, that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but like uh, of, of, of a, inside one of the one of the kind of the the, the mausoleums, one of the tombs, there's like uh, four different statues of people in like a kind of in a in a, in a repose, um, in a meditation position, facing each other. And it's very hard to tell if they're actually corpses or statues. Never seen anything. <laughs> it's really, really weird. Really interesting. Um, I've I've got a couple of things that I've brought back from Nepal, which at some stage I will um, I will interject and show you, and you can tell me what the hell I brought back into my house. <laughs> I'll see if I know what they are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I know I got Mahakala. I got, I got that one. Mm. Um, but um, I got a couple of other tribal masks. But we'll get we'll get that in, we'll get into that in, in, in due course. So I'm excited. You you mentioned there's kind of a diverse background there. You were kind of in, in kind of Norse and Germanic rune work, mm-hmm. and, and kind of it, and then kind of uh, wanted to explore this particular aspect of of Buddhism further. Kind of um, mm-hmm. what kind of first drew you into it, and and then to a kind of um, I guess close out that question. What um, I mean, there may not be a thing. It might be a gradual thing, but what if if anything kind of um made you go okay this is this is for me this is real this is working um well i i think what drew me to it first is just the the imagery of like a lot of the wrathful deities because i had this misconception of buddhism as, uh, as being almost like a uh over overly pacifistic and I mean, I come from a ranching family and, you know, I've always watched stories of the old West and there's kind of a, that survival mentality is kind of, it's, there, there are brutal aspects of it. And I kind of found that idea of Buddhism being this extremely, like almost weak pacifistic religion, which it totally isn't. I'm not, I don't hold that belief anymore, but I had a hard time connecting to it. I mean, I love the, the, meditative aspects i love the loving kindness i loved all of that and it really resonated with me but it was only when i started to learn about vajrayana buddhism that and the stories of like dujam lingpa rinpoche and padma sambhava and how they're taming these demons using purvas and they're like these powerful sorcerers and they're bringing like blessings to their people it was only when I started learning about that and a lot of the wrathful deities and looking at these Tonka paintings that it really, it awoke something in me. Like I really resonated with it. And alongside that, it's such a healing thing to practice. It like the, you know, the Four Noble Truths, the Noble Eightfold Path. Like it really helped me pick myself up when I needed it and like start building myself into the man that I really want to be. A lot of that credit goes to Buddhism. And when I started to get into the more sorcerous aspect of it, it was through Kurukula. <laughs> and I remember once I, I started working with Kurukula to just attract things and people to me. And just gradually, I was seeing it really work. Like it, it, there was some very uncanny circumstances and the same thing with Ganesha. Like I would be doing road openings with Ganesha and I needed a place to live. I mean, I, I couldn't live with my parents anymore at the time. And, you know, I'd been traveling, I'd come back, I'd travel, I'd come back and I did this work with Ganesha and he just manifested a house for me in like less than a week. And he recently did that for me. But that's, a, you know, that's further down the line. So it was really Karukula and Ganesha that really showed me how potent this stuff really is. And then eventually I started working with Akala. And Akala, or Fudo Myo'o to the Japanese, um, he's, he's a wrathful meditating Buddha with a sword and a noose. You might have seen him before. Um, I was in a circumstance at that time, a living situation where I wasn't very happy. And I initiated working with him through the tantras. I would read the tantra of Kandamaha Rosanna, and I would just ask him for guidance because I really connected with his imagery. And 
he completely burned my life down. <laughs> I mean, he wrecked everything and he drug me out of that situation to somewhere new. And after that was when I really started to connect with Tantra. That's when I found the Vajra Kalaya practice and Purba. And I started to read more Tantras and I started to work with Amitabha. And it, it's just been a very, it, it's it's been throwing me around and putting me in different places, bringing new practices to me. Um, it's uncanny, but I start I got into it mostly just for the I guess self help, and it just it took a totally different direction. Thank you. I I find it really interesting that you talk about getting into it for the self help. Um. Because I and I think it's a really courageous thing to say because I think a lot of people talk about getting into this for our magic more broadly, the the, the occult, the esoteric more broadly, getting into it for you know power or, or kind of wealth or to bring um, lovers into your life, that kind of stuff. Um, but I think an awful, actually, most people really get into it to for self-help of some description you know then those those things tend to be kind of superficial manifestations of like a gap in one's life mm -hmm. and emptiness you know mm -hmm. um but 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 truly that there, there's some way that there there's this transformation going to happen um and you and, and you mentioned kind of getting the the edges knocked off you a little bit by um but that spirit you mentioned, um, that sounds <laughs> sounds unfortunately familiar. Um, I, like the the kind of the the witchcraft spirits that that um are part of my life now, um, tend to dish out the kickings. <laughs> yeah, like a horse. Yeah, on a regular basis, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting to hear it's a, a similar um, occurrence in, in in your area. Um, so when when you say you you got you got back from traveling, where was that? You you went to Nepal to to explore this, or or you went to a particular um, place in the states? Where 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 did you go? There's a retreat center in Crestone, Colorado, called uh, Vajra Vidya. Right. And that's where I went to, I did a three day retreat. And by the end of it, I was going, <laughs> I'm not going to lie, spending all day meditating, being away from my phone at the time. I was, I was a bit younger and that's I was just boring. used to being on my phone all the time. Yeah. And that was very difficult for me, but I, I kind of liked that about it. Mm -hmm. And I, I just felt like I was, I was going to explode <laughs> by the end of it. Mm -hmm. And that kind of, made me realize that I had a lot of, I had a lot of shit I had to do. <laughs> mm. That's that's an interesting point. Like um like I, I, I fairly kind of um I, I through 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 my work from my practice and, and I know I know a lot of people who listen to the show will be rolling their eyes now. They're like, oh he's off again and talking about this shite. Uh but um I I certainly had spirit communication from my tutelary spirit about not engaging in in online bun fights, not engaging in that shit at all, mm. and actually limiting the exposure I have. Um and and that was hard. It was really hard actually because it made me realize I was quite addicted to to that scrolling and all that kind of stuff. And but yep. But uh I hear you what you're saying like when when you kind of are cut off from that stuff it feels like you've lost a limb. It's a very, um, it's a humbling experience knowing that you kind of have that dependency on, um, on your device or on the atten the superficial attention of others, you know, um, it's sickening. It's fucking weird, isn't it? Sickening. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. Um, I'm, I often feel a little bit like I'm a bit lectury about it. You know, mm. and I and I kind of am, but like, 
it is fucked up, right? I'm not I'm not being an idiot here. It is fucked up, right? No. That's, yeah. No. Yeah. It's not a good thing. It's it's matrixy. Yeah. It's samsaric. Yeah. Yeah. And exactly. I I almost feel like I mean this year for me, just just like I, I guess since maybe September, October, it's been the happiest year of my life. And right. that's great. I, I still I still catch myself in that like being too focused to my phone, like, oh, how's my business doing? Oh, how's this doing? Mm. When I should really be like going hiking with my fiance, or I should be, you know, <laughs> having a barbecue with my friends or visiting my parents or just just doing my practice, living more life. Like yeah. that's that's I think that's such a good thing is it's vague, but just live life. Mm. Like do what you're supposed to do as a human being. Spend yeah. time outside. Yeah. Spend time with the people who love you. Yeah, I hear you. I, I, I hear you. And like um certainly you know, for me to doing that a bit, doing that more, following that instruction more it has it's not it's not cheap in my life in any way it's just improved it no. like in every aspect of it like i i look at it and i go well you know i'm not having emotional reactions to the kind of bullshit i see on my phone or shit people are saying and I, I i don't have an engagement with that that's that's a good thing that is a good thing yeah um I mean, did you have any, I guess, spirit interaction with that around kind of like, you know, the spirits tur- hold up a phone and go, this shit, <laughs> you need to really watch this thing because it's, it's a, this is a, this cut both, this cuts both ways. Um, my spirits haven't really, uh, they haven't really brought that to my attention, but I mean, in, in like a, in a non subtle way is what right. I'm saying. Yeah, I'm sure they have in a more subtle way. Sure, sure. Because sure. what I've noticed with tantric deities, unless you actively approach them trying to talk to them, okay, their influence is very subtle. Like okay. their influence in in your life, what they want you to be doing. Yeah. Like every once in a while, I'll, I'll have like just a feeling, oh, I shouldn't be doing this, mm. or uh, it's it's very hard to explain, but. Mm. I'm I'm a big believer that being around spirits, whether they're negative or positive, if you can even call them that, yeah, um, it's going to have very subtle influences on your behavior, and I've seen that in myself and in other people, and what? that's been that's been very with myself. I mean, it's hard to study, but when you see other people reacting to that, that's when it gets very interesting. I I feel. Mm. I've I've lived in haunted areas, like a haunted uh, dorm complex, and I witnessed what living there did to some people, and it was just kind of shocking. Okay. No, I I can imagine. Uh, the, I mean, the reason I ask is, well, I mean, a lot of my spirit communication isn't that subtle. Is that? Mm. I think I'm too dim not to get it. I think they've kind of they 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 know what they're working with. They're like, no, we need to be pretty explicit with it. Spell, spell it out. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it it was fairly explicit for me, and very much um focused in a rural landscape. Like mm. that's that's kind of where it all kicks off for me. But anyway, um. I was just interested in kind of pulling that thread, um, kind of to to kind of kind of compare notes as it as it were. But um, yes, sir. So you you found this practice has Im- improved your life wholesale. It's opened doors for you. It sounds like it's been a really kind of um, like a a, a balancing experience. Like it cleared a lot of blocks for you. Absolutely, yeah. Um, one of the biggest blocks. Uh, for me has been just I guess it's difficult to talk about but I think just that in this generation in this day and age it's always been finding a partner you're compatible with sure and I think with Tantra like once you have that it, it unlocks so many doors in that practice 
And this year I finally managed to do that. Mm -hmm. And um, like, it's also helped me deal with a lot of my trauma right. through uh, Tumo and Chod. Uh, those are two practices that I, I've learned. And I don't know, I feel like uh, I, I always call myself, I'm a more complete beast. <laughs> I like that. I, it, it's if if you're looking for a practice that has the sorcery, the philosophy, and the healing. I mean, tantra might be something to look into if you're listening to this. It's whether it's Hindu tantra or Tibetan tantra. I mean, they're very distinct and different. But maybe maybe one of those is for you. Um, and the relationships that you cultivate with these deities, it's very loving. It's a very like when you're doing sadhana with one deity, you completely fall, give yourself into the rapture of just falling in love with this spirit, falling in love with this deity. And it, it's a freeing experience. And I mean, it can be a sorceress sadhana where you're trying to have an end goal in sight, but the love is part of, it's part of that experience. And you'll get these strange coincidences. I've, I've been doing Karukula work, and in her iconography, I don't know if you can see it very well, but she's holding an, a bow and arrow. Right. I've actually found arrowheads on two occasions. I can even pick them up and show you. Wow. I found arrowheads when I've been hiking and working with her. Wow, that's so cool. It, it, I, I about shit a brick when I found it, but... <laughs> um i had been sitting on a on a mountaintop mm. chanting uh Kurukula mantras at the time and i i was hiking and i had the i had the inkling to like look down at my feet and i picked my boot up and i look and sure enough it's a damn red arrowhead wow that's incredible and i've had a I've had acquaintances, like after I was doing Purba, I had an acquaintance just walk up to me out of nowhere and offer to sell me a tri-dagger. And I was like, whoa! And that was when I was just getting into it. It Just the, the synchronicities are some of the coolest part of any magic for me. I mean, the things yeah, that just pop yeah. up out of nowhere. No, I, I really resonate with that. Yeah, that is that is true. Really true. And and you you mentioned the Purba. For for those listening who may not be familiar with that word, what it means, can you can you talk through that? I sure can. And I have this copper purba right here. So the purba is a Tibetan ritual object that is you can see it as a manifestation of the deity Vajrakalaya. And Vajrakalaya not Vajrakalaya, oh my god. Um, Vajrakalaya, he or Dorje Purba, as some people call him, he is a wrathful manifestation of one of the Buddhas. Some people say it's Vajrasattva. Some people say it's another Buddha. To me, he he's a manifestation of Vajrasattva, but uh, he's a manifestation of a wrathful Buddha that, according to the myths and in the lore, he incarnated to destroy a demon whose name was a uh, Rudra. And okay. Rudra, yeah. Rud Rudra is also a name for Shiva, but Rudra was in this story. He was destroying the whole world. And so the Buddhas approached Rudra's wife and impregnated her through possibly dubious means. Um, and the child was Vajrakalaya. And so Vajrakalaya is half demon, half Buddha. And so his, he, like through the help of the deity Hayagriva, destroyed Rudra. And th so that's essentially the lore behind him. And er, er, Vajrakalaya appeared to the uh, founder of Tibetan Buddhism, essentially Padmasambhava, and gave him all of the termas of Vajrakalaya to hide. And the termas are, they're kind of like grimoires. Oh, pardon me um and so yeah he gave them all these practices to subdue the evil spirits of tibet 
And so the Purva, it is like adam adam yeah, adamantine awareness. Like it is it is a dagger that pierces t- to the very heart of the true nature of reality. And that's how you should look at it. Um, the practice is all about, it's a very destructive practice, but it's also a very healing practice. Um, you can cut anything with a purva when you're doing purva ritual. You can cut your own negative emotions, anger, greed, hatred, desire. You can cut any obstacles that are in your life. You can cut illnesses. And through the purva practice, there's a whole mandala of like thousands of spirits. Like, so you have essentially, you have these four kings and then you, or these four sons, there's a supreme sons. You have Vajrakalaya's consort, Dipta Chakra. And then you have 10 kings that are on the outer side of the mandala and you have four gatekeepers. And these are all spirits who you work with inside of that mandala. And through, like through Purva, you, you can use this system to approach any problem in your life, whether it's internal or external. It, and it's, it's an amazing practice and it's so effective. Um, and it's a lot witchier than you, you would expect it to be. Like part of Purba ritual involves, and I don't know how much of this I, like, I'm allowed to talk about, but I, I'm, I'm sure I'm fine talking about this. It involves creating an effigy and destroying it and then scattering it to the wind. And that effigy, all of your problems or an enemy or negative emotions are sealed within this poppet and ritually consecrated as that, pro- as that, uh, as the thing you're sealing within it, then it's destroyed. And that's just one way to work with Purba. It's a huge, vast arcana. You can spend years learning about everything Purba has to teach because there's different tra- traditions and schools within Tibetan Buddhism that have different teachings on Purba. Um, there's, there's books, there's courses. Jason Miller has a great course on Purba. Um, and there's just so much to learn about it. It's such a vast arcana. And there's so much you can do with it. You can take away someone's protection using Purba. You can attract wealth using Purba. You can attract lovers using Purba. You can you can protect yourself using Purba. Like there, you can pacify negative situations using Purba. And an interesting tidbit that I I'm not I haven't seen it covered in a podcast like this is each each different um, I guess enlightened activity like increasing, enthralling, attracting, pacifying has a purba of a corresponding metal for it. So copper, this would be the attracting aspect. Copper is it's Venusian, you know, as we know in the West. And it, like each each different kind of metal of a purba has a different purpose. So it's it's a vast arcana and there's there's a lot that goes into learning purba. I read um I don't know where I read this, but I read somewhere that the the the, the sky iron purba are the the most powerful for exorcism. You can do anything with the sky iron purba. Oh wow. It's, it's, that's a very powerful purba. Right. Um, acacia wood purvas are also very powerful. Right. And right. then there's also purvas that have killed someone. Those are also said to be very powerful. Right. Okay. Um, and in terms of the structure of the knife, you've got three blades. Uh, yeah. And then we've got, is it, is it four faces, four demonic faces in the back? Yeah, let me grab one to kind of show the listeners here. So you have three faces. Okay. And you have, it's a three-faced dagger. Yeah. And each part of this purba is a symbol. So the three faces are the three faces of Vajrakalaya. They could also be three of the Wrathful Kings, which would be right. Hayagriva, Amrita Kundali. And in some traditions, it's a Kala. In others, it's, a, it's another deity of the Ten Kings. 
and then you have a crocodile mouth leading down to the blade. And these are nagas on this side. Right. And uh, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but purba kind of roughly means like nail or to nail down. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And that's a lot of the practice. It isn't just destroying, like you can use mm. the purba to nail things down. Right. Okay. Um, and it, in terms of like using using the, that that um ritual implement in one's practice, um, like if someone was just to like buy a purba off uh off eBay um and try and start working with it, I mean. Is that a barrier to it, or is this something that should arrive? You should arrive at your doorstep somehow, without you kind of interrupting. Um, yeah. Well, I've I've never necessarily received a purba just out of the blue. I bought all of mine. Yeah. But it isn't just an athame. It isn't yeah. just yet yeah. a simple um, ritual dagger. Okay, that's a really good point. Thank you. Um, like it has, you you would need to. So there, there's ways to consecrate a purba that are unique to that tradition. Yeah. And then there are also, uh, when you use a purba, there's a certain way to use it. And there's right. a certain way to, uh, I guess, bring life to it. And that's through deity yoga, through visualizing okay. yourself as a deity. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and I, I, the, the amazing thing I've heard about purbas, um, is just how, irrespective of what tradition somebody works in, whether a ceremony, a magician, um, a witch, or whatever, these implements are highly respected. And I've known um, a lot of different practitioners, when they need something really done, they go to the purpose. Mm -hmm. Irrespective of where they're from or what tradition they're educated in. What do you well, say? the per uh, in my experience, and I'm just speaking from my experience. I've I've been doing the purba close to a year and a half now. Mm -hmm. Um, so take that, <laughs> take with that what you will. Right. Um, yeah. There are so many deities attached to the purba, and these are very powerful, very ancient deities, and some of them are local land deities that were subdued by people who used the purba, so they're very wrathful. Right. Um, that that I think plays a pretty big role in it, and just the the nature of a purba, it's cutting into the very the deepest aspect of reality. And alongside that, there's all these crazy wrathful spirits attached to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've I've been in situations where I I had friends who were having some paranormal issues go on. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, they they actually had a flute. They bought a flute at a, a flea market in New Mexico. And uh, the flute started, they started hearing flute music by itself, which is pretty creepy. Yeah, definitely. And so, <laughs> and they, they're like, all right, so how about you come out here and see if there's anything you can do with it? And I get my perba out and you could... I, I've had some strange paranormal experiences, but it felt like when I got the perb out, like the spirit started to run away. Really? Wow. Like there, you could hear noise. So they had this yard and you could hear noise in their sheds, like, and it was moving further and further away. Mm -hmm. Like, and I hadn't even chanted any mantras. I hadn't even begun doing the actual perba practice. Just me pulling it out. Mm -hmm freak that spirit was like oh shit oh shit oh shit and that's <laughs> that's the power that's inherent mm. in a purba it, it's a very powerful piece of ritual technology right yeah and, I, and i've seen um like exorcists even in the in the uk who well i mean don't overtly practice any specific tradition but use the purba uh, crystal purba yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm. uh, uh, as their kind of um, weapon of choice, really. 
um, for conducting those rituals. Well, I'm sure it's very effective. From, I'm yeah, sure. From, I'm sure it's very effective. From what I hear, absolutely. Yeah. Um. So you 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 seem to have been kind of really immersed into into this school or um this this way um over the last few years um when it's changed your life for the better mm-hmm. so what's what's kind of happening now how are you developing your practice um so what i've kind of been working on here lately is uh i've been learning about a deity called marichi she's a goddess of the dawn she's very big in japan and in uh, a lot of the yep. Buddhism there, because they practice an esoteric Buddhist tradition as well. Yeah. In the Shingon and the Tendai schools. Um, she, Marichi is a very sorceress deity. She's, um, she pops up a lot in the Kriya Tantra tradition, which it's all, almost all just pure witchy uh, tantric stuff. Like there's some spell prescriptions to make poppets yep. and using black thorn to poke them and uh, fire offerings. Uh, mm. so I'm, I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting pretty invested in learning about her. I haven't begun to work with her yet at all, Yeah, but a lot of her work is done at sunrise and sunset. Um, I've been brushing up on the Kandamaha Rosanna Tantra and yeah. been working on deepening my relationship with Akala. Um, I've also been getting some empowerments here and there. I recently yeah. got a Hayagriva empowerment. So I've been trying to find some Arcana on Hayagriva. Um, I've been doing some more work with the local land spirits, and I plan to uh, start doing work with the Nagas. Okay. Um, and can you explain yeah, so, what, what the Nagas, Nagas are? So Nagas are... Some people see them as dragons. Other people see them as serpent spirits. But to me, it's all the same. Yeah, they are very. They're potentially very wrathful spirits that are attached to natural sources of water. And there are certain areas that are what they call naga haunted. So that means there's a lot of nagas there, and they're very active. And nagas, when they're pleased with you, they can bring rain. They can bring fertile harvests. They can bring wealth, but if they're pissed off at you, they can give you leprosy, eczema, skin conditions. They can kill you. They can, and this is for all, for people who aren't protected, you know, it's like normies essentially, but, um, Nagas can really mess you up if you piss them off. Like if you urinate in a stream, not really a good idea if it's Naga haunted or not a good idea, period, because river spirits, Naga or not, are always, very uh abrasive or they can be Mm. um and so in in the tibetan tradition there are ways to approach nagas and deities who can help you with that um they're kind they act as intermediaries so karukal is one of them high agriva is probably the one people go to the most um akala can help with that and yeah so just for me, like I've I've had a pretty keen interest in just working with the different classes of spirits in Buddhism, like the pretas, the the dead, the uh, the nagas, the asuras, the rakshas, just different classes of of local spirits. I want to bring my practice a little bit more local than it has been. Fine, fine. I was always um fascinated about um the Nagas kind of as a whole, because they, they turn up in Hinduism as well. And, and, um, and then uh, in Buddhism as well. And you, you see it all over Thailand as well. There's I can't yes. remember the name of There's the King of the Nagas, the seven head, the seven headed Naga you see. Is, um, oh, which is Vasuki. Vasuki. That's right. Yeah. 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 Vasuki. It, yeah. Shielding, shielding the Buddha, uh, sheltering the Buddha. Uh, but you also see with Shiva as well. Uh, yes, Shiva. Um, yeah, I, I think it's Shiva. Or yeah. no, it's Vishnu. Vishnu. Okay, so yeah, I also said it's a Krishna um, avatar, right? Yeah. Um, yes. Yep. I always get my my blue gods confused. Unless I can see them. Oh. Who's got the skulls? Who's got the peacocks? Feathers. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Yep. But, uh, 
there is that interesting place up in North East India or Nagaland. And um, yes, it, you know, quite an intense place, used to be full of headhunter tribes, um, inhospitable land, um, and, and kind of a little bit more. I guess you could say Burmese or Thai in terms of of the the ethnicity of of people or kind of you know that same broad group. Um, I'm familiar, but it's it's you know it's actually called Nagaland, you know, mm-hmm. and it always kind of stuck with me of like, um, why is that? And kind of you know the the that these beings have an actual kind of um, well, you could you could argue country named after them really. Yeah, I've I've always wondered that too. I haven't been able to turn up too much information about it though, because I've heard of of Nagaland and mm. I mean the distinct uh in the distinct ethnicity that lives yeah. there. But yeah, I've I've never I've never been able to parse together why it's called that myself either. Yeah, as well because it, it it's I mean from what I can recall, it's certainly not kind of a a Buddhist or a Hindu area, you know, um, it's far closer to kind of an indigenous, indigenous kind of like, um, for want of a better example, but like Bon type shamanism, Mm. um, Mm. but is very visceral, you know, uh, when you think about the the Kapala being a a kind of a a core ritual tool within, um, the the type of work you practice. And headhunting is, mm-hmm. is such a major part of that Nagaland um, cultural tradition. Um, I could be projecting here and making um, vast sweeping correlations, but it's interesting. It's an interesting thread to pull. You know? um, so for people who want to find out more about your work, if they want to follow you or indeed avail of your services, what's the best way for them to do so? So the best way to do so, uh, you can either uh, find me on Facebook under Fire Blood Bone, or you can find me on Instagram, Fire Blood Bone, and just send me a DM. It might take me a day or two just due to my family has a ranch, as I've said before, and it's calving season. So (laughs) things have been pretty busy here lately. Um, But I really appreciate the opportunity to come on to your show. It's I've I've really enjoyed this. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Really nice to have you on. It's been a really interesting conversation. And and again, thank you for your patience. um, Of course, you know, in in getting things sorted. And um, as I said, kind of in our our earlier session, unfortunately, haven't been very well. So I hope it's not been too noticeable. But um, that's good. That's good. But uh, yeah, it's been a it's been a real treat talking to you, and uh, I enjoyed it. I'm still reeling from the human tongue purba. That's wild. Fuck me, that's crazy. I'll uh, I'll send you a link to the book where that's mentioned. Thank you. Yeah, so you I can, do. I, so you can check it out. Yeah, I do. And please send me all kind of the relevant links for kind of your areas and where you'd like people to 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 to, to follow to or or to, to look. That would be really great. Um. Well, Kobe, it's been an absolute pleasure. Really, really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you very much for coming on the Spirit Box. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. you colby that was fascinating i'm still that purba made from a tongue that is that is dark wow that's blowing me away interesting stuff so if you want to find out more about colby's work or indeed um uh, engage him for get some of his services then check out the show notes below and i'll leave it there take care and talk soon i'm darren mason and you've been listening to the spirit box